Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Femi Taiwo, and I'm the chair of Africana as we speak. And I always uh, like to point out that I don't think there's uh, a cheaper access to being famous than being chair. <laughs> Because everything that's happening, you are called upon to show your face. So, you know, even though people don't, uh, you don't deserve to have your face, nobody are there every time. So thank you very much, uh, Rishi, for making me famous again uh, by asking me to say some words of welcome to all of you. Um, yes, first, I want to thank uh, the panelists, you know, um, <clears throat> Professor Elizabeth Boyd and Professor Tara McPherson. It's good to meet you, uh, even if virtually. Uh, but I also want to thank you on behalf of our programming committee, of which uh, Rishi is uh, a key member, and Professor Ndri Ase Lumumba, who is on leave this semester, but I'm sure uh, did her part before she went away um, for putting this all together. But to thank you very much for saying yes to us and being a part of this. Um, I always believe that when you invite people and they say yes, they pay you tribute. So we hope we never mess it up such that you don't want to come hang out with us in future. So thank you very much for agreeing uh, to do this. Uh, I would also like to thank our events coordinator, Shelby Champlain, uh, who is uh, uh, managing this as we speak but also the rest of the front desk uh, staff uh, who always uh, pull the pieces together to enable us have this event uh, right now. Um, <clears throat> to our co-sponsors, the FGSS and American Studies uh, for always uh, working with us to put together all these uh, great events. And uh, to all of you who have decided to spend part of your evening with us, we never take that for granted. We are always grateful that you say yes to us when we call you, and we hope that that will continue to be the case into the far future. Uh, I'm very glad as chair and as a member of this department to have this department hold an event like this, and I'm thankful for all the contributions by all of you to make this happen. Uh, without further ado, Professor Richardson. Please. Thank you so much, Professor Tawo, for your wonderful opening remarks. And I want to echo my uh, thanks to our esteemed panelists, to the Africana Studies and Research Center, to our co-sponsors, cool FGSS and American Studies, to the audience. Uh, that we have today and that we will continue to have once this event is posted and to the University of Georgia Press. Since 2005, I have had the honor and pleasure of serving as the co-editor of the New Southern Studies book series. It's a series that I edited also from 2018 until 2022, and that I currently co-edit alongside the historian Maurice Hobson, who hopefully will join us later in the afternoon. I um, am so thankful for the support of the press in general, and Southern Beauty is uh, a new publication that is not published in this series, but that I was so delighted to blurb a few months ago after initially reading. And, and so one of my hopes was to uh, hold an event that would help launch the book. So this event has been a long time in planning since last summer. And I'm really thankful that we have reached this point where we're literally um, finally able to come together today. I want to thank uh, Bethany Sneed, especially with whom Maurice and I have the pleasure of working as our um, acquisitions editor and uh, all of the support um, at the press more generally. There's so many of us who really are excited about this book, and it's been um, featured already in a number of outstanding uh, talks and dialogues. And so I'm so thankful that we at Cornell 
are also able to um, host this uh, landmark event. One of the reasons that I am interested in having this conversation is that it engages the topic of monuments and symbols in the U.S. South in a way that we have not seen heretofore. Um, in 2015, in the wake of the Charleston tragedy at Mother Emanuel AME Church, I ended up in the uh, middle of these national dialogues that we've witnessed in more recent years about symbols and monuments when I was invited by the New York Times to write an op-ed about other symbols that need to go. And I wrote about Aunt Jemima, and then that conversation resurfaced again very prominently in the national arena in the wake of George Floyd's um, tragic death. And, and so as someone who has been deeply engaged in um, dialogues and debates about monuments myself, I was really intrigued to see uh, Professor Boyd's study when it was um, released. The other thing is that um, I have, at myself as a scholar, worked on research related to the intersection of race and femininity. Um, for a long time, I've been a huge fan of Professor Tara McPherson in general, including her landmark and really path-breaking study, Reconstructing Dixie, that was released back in 2003, I think, by Duke University Press, and was really an exciting moment in Southern studies, um, a study that looks at images of Southern femininity as they have recurred over time in the media in a range of formats from film to television, for instance. And she presents a theoretical uh, framework that's also, I think, quite compelling and useful, this notion of the lenticular that mirrors in certain ways forms of separation that are evident in the social world of Jim Crow and Southern segregation. And so I hope that at some point in this conversation, she'll talk more about these frameworks. But once um, the study was available, I knew that I had to uh, try to get uh, Professor Boyd and Professor McPherson in the room together for a dialogue. And um, this is a virtual version of that, but one that I think will be a treat for all of us. Um, Blaine Roberts is another scholar who's very um, profoundly influenced me and um, from whom I learned a lot about this topic. So roughly we will proceed today by having some um, reading by Professor Boyd from this compelling book for the first few minutes. We will then have a, a dialogue between Professor McPherson and Professor Boyd, in which Professor um, McPherson um, identifies key questions and topics that are particularly useful to highlight from this book. We'll then have a more free-flowing Q&A with the audience and um, perhaps circle back to some closing comments from the speakers and some final words from Professor Tawo. So that's roughly um, how we hope to proceed today. I want to turn to a reading of the biographies of these esteemed scholars and then turn the floor over to Professor Boyd for her reading. Tara McPherson, is the HMH Foundation Endowed Chair for the Study of Censorship in Media and Professor of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Southern California's School of Cinematic Arts and Director of the Sidney Hartman Academy for Polymathic Studies and also an affiliated faculty member in the American Studies and Ethnicity Department. Her research engages the cultural dimensions of media, including the intersection of gender, race, effect, and place. She has a particular interest in digital media. Her most recent book, Feminist in a Software Lab, 
was published by Harvard University Press in 2018 and received the 2018 Garfinkel Prize in Digital Humanities. Her Reconstructing Dixie, Race, Gender, and Nostalgia in the Imagined South received the 2004 John G. Calwetti Award for the Outstanding Book Published on American Culture, among other awards. She is co-editor of Hop on Pop, The Politics and Pleasures of Popular Culture and Transmedia Frictions, The Digital, The Arts, and The Humanities, and editor of Digital Youth, Innovation and the Unexpected, part of the MacArthur Foundation series on digital media and learning. Her writing has appeared in numerous... Elizabeth Boyd is an interdisciplinary scholar whose experience growing up in Jackson, Mississippi during the civil rights movement and its aftermath inspired her to study, teach, and write about the U.S. South. Her research explores the gendered performance of race and region. She holds a BA in journalism, broadcasting, and film from Trinity University, an MA in Southern Studies from the University of Mississippi, and a PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. She has served on the faculties of Vanderbilt University, University of Mississippi, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and as a postdoctoral fellow at Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities and as visiting fellow at the Humanities Research Center, Australian National yeah. University. She is past president of the Kentucky, Tennessee American Studies Association and the Chesapeake American Studies Association. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, the New Encyclopedia of Southern Culture, Chick Lit, The New Woman's Fiction, and Southern Cultures. Her book, Southern Beauty, Race, Ritual, and Memory in the Modern South, was published by the University of Georgia Press in 2022. She lives in Tacoma Park, Maryland. With that said, I want to give a hearty welcome to everyone who has joined us today and turn the floor over to Professor Boyd. Thank you so much for that introduction and welcome, Roche uh, and colleagues. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to um, have a discussion about my new book. Um, I wanted to begin by reading a passage or two. I could read a passage and then we could maybe talk about it a little bit or yeah, why don't we try that? And then uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm going to begin at the beginning. <clears throat> this is from my introduction, which is called Power Play. The decision was widely denounced as over the top. After University of Oklahoma members of Sigma Alpha Epsilon, a fraternity with Southern roots, were caught on video in 2015, chanting a racist song with references to lynching. Greek leaders and campus officials at the University of Georgia announced a prohibition of hoop skirts. The reaction of many white UGA students and onlookers ranged from irritation to disbelief. The costume of choice for such campus events as Kappa Alpha's Old South Week and SAE's Magnolia Ball had nothing to do with racial intolerance, critics claimed. It was just fashion. And the crinoline embargo was yet another kowtow to political correctness. Contemplating, atten uh, contemplating attendance at such events without their sartorial standby, collegians wondered aloud, what did the hoop have to do with the hate? But at least one UGA administrator understood all too well the ability of Southern symbols to suggest and even celebrate structures of inequality. Relegating the hoop skirt to mothballs required only a single meeting with Greek student leaders who, concerned with inviting negative attention, came to agree that such attire was, quote unquote, not appropriate in the context of some events. If there was dissension among their ranks, their silence concealed it. Ironically, the same campus leaders who brokered the ban limited its impact by quelling discussion of their decision. 
After a flash of national publicity, the story failed to gain traction and other schools did not rush to enact similar prescriptions. Choos choosing silence over discussion, campus leaders shut down a potent symbol at UGA, but made no call for its curtailment elsewhere. In the end, the episode was a testament to the continuing power of Southern symbols, but also to the power of silence. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, I'm gonna thank Roche and the department at Cornell for bringing us together. As Roche mentioned, it's been 20 years since um, my book Reconstructing Dixie was published. And um, much of the work I've done in the intervening years has strayed away from the South in a number of ways um, as a professor who lives in Los Angeles now for many years. But the South has come back to me in many ways in the last five years as an object to think about and with and through, given the larger um, political conversations that I think you um, eloquently signal um, in the introduction to Southern beauty, the tensions around the rise of Donald Trump, the tensions around um, the murder of George Floyd, the renewed interest in Confederate symbols that have really animated conversations around the nation in many ways, and finally led to those um, public monuments in the Confederacy coming down in many places, um, not without tensions and assaults, but finally coming down. And, you know, to return to New Orleans and not have um, Robert E. Lee presiding over the city was a very um, powerful and, and meaning moment for me personally. So I think in the intro, when you chase, trace the persistence of the Southern Lady and the Southern Belle across um, many, many decades, you know, over a century, and the resilience with which those two figures continue to um, inflect or infect popular memory, I, I think you are on to kind of um, the way those silences allow imagery to continue. So I wondered if you might, I love the way you talk about the South continually requiring production. You know, it's, it's a, a region and a place that um, persist in the American imaginary in very real ways, but that persistence is requires work and it's continually renewed through a variety of rituals you describe so well in the book. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to what you noticed across a hundred years in persistence and in change. Is the Southern beauty that we see in 2023 um, in her kind of white hoop skirt form, the same Southern beauty of 1920? What, what stays across time and what morphs in order to keep the image um, persistent in a Southern frame? Yeah, so uh, what persists, of course, is the uh, sort of prescription that young white Southern women be able to um, enact this very specific, precise performance uh, as, sit as situations demand um, so that they can sort of do white Southern womanhood in a way that is instantly recognizable, even when it's not part of their day-to-day uh, visage. Um, and, and, and that just, uh, as you say, say uh, I trace that across these decades, uh, because it gets more and more strange <laughs> as the decades go on, um, that there's such a gap between uh, your, your everyday um, um, way of, of dressing and fashioning yourself, and, uh, and, and yet that this is a specific sort of requirement um, th uh, that these young women be able to continue these uh, performances. And for those of you who haven't read the book yet, um, uh, I look at three uh, feminine rituals in particular, uh, the beauty pageant, sorority rush, 
and uh, the Confederate pageant of the Natchez Pilgrimage, which is a home and garden uh, pilgrimage to this day um, that for 82 years, I was adding it up before we got on the Zoom, um, they, it really didn't change very much. It, it did change a few years ago and, and remains unresolved about how they will tell the story of the Natchez past. That, um, the, I'm, in, I'm, I'm interested in the persistence of the images despite so many things that have changed, right? And if you see, um, I mean, maybe you could tell the audience a little bit about the process for the book, because one of the things I find interesting in it is its kind of mixed method approach. So it's both tracing historical change in different moments, but it's also using ethnography in interesting ways. So maybe um, for folks who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, you could talk a little bit about how you chose what to feature in the book and what the process of doing that ethnographic work was like. Sure. Uh, well, so I really wrote the book to explain this, this sort of wall of white Southern femininity that I found when I returned to Mississippi from Texas, which has its own aesthetic, as Roche has written about. <laughs> um, and, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. Uh, but I had been away for a few years and was coming back to work on a master's in Southern studies. And I just had forgotten how intensely competitive and specific um, this white femininity was. And it was everywhere. And of course, I was at the University of Mississippi, which is sort of ground zero. Um, and so I kept thinking, and, and at that time, um, there was a real, there was a lot of um, uh, intellectual, uh, work being done on whiteness and, and also on Southern identity about, uh, you know, why is Southern identity coded white so often? And I kept thinking, you know, why is that? And which when it on its face is absurd. Um, but, um, and, I, and I was seeing these rituals pretty up close, uh, especially the sorority rush. Um, and I, I, decided that there must be some going something for more than you know getting new members or winning a particular contest or or showing your antebellum homes there was there was more going on there than those um, those projects and so uh, I, I was curious about how that what did southern white southern femininity have to do with this idea of southern identity being white and and being able to share that identity would we ever share it <laughs> And so I decided to, um, uh, I, I wanted to um, conduct observation, ethnographic observation, which of course I did um, with each of the three rituals. And, uh, but I also wanted to understand the, from the perspective of the participants themselves, what were their motivations and what were they getting out of it? Uh, what was their experience like? Were they wholly invested? Did they even think about it? Were they ambivalent? And to do that, I, I decided to do some oral history interview, taped interviews, essentially. So, um, and that was very, um, well, it was very time consuming, <laughs> but it was also very revealing. Um, you know, because I would have gotten, I would have been able to write one type of analysis simply observing uh, from afar. Um, but I would not have been able to write the book that I did without including the perspectives of these young women. So yeah, it is a, a combination of ethnographic uh, and of course, secondary historical research, archival research. Um, but I also you know, went behind the scenes, if you will, at uh, not only at pageants, but at Sorority Rush, which I don't think that, that I would be allowed to do the research that I did back then today. <laughs> um, but I was given full reign to see like three different um, formal sorority recruitment periods at the University of Mississippi and at the University of Alabama. Um, and that was fascinating. 
Yeah, I, th I, th I absolutely agree with you that I think it would be hard to do that ethnographic research today because the political divisions in the country are very entrenched. And I think distrust is is even, you know, higher than it would have been in, in the early 2000s. And, and wonder, there, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, there were uh, uh, at Alabama, they not every single um, organization allowed me to observe. Um, there were some that did not, um, and the administration was much more cagey about it, you know, being concerned with, a, a, you know, I, I wasn't a reporter, they understood that, but, uh, you know, how was this going to make them look, what was I going to write, um, but they let me observe, and I, my understanding was that they discouraged the girls from doing interviews with me, but um, I had no lack of interview subjects they came to me, they wanted to be um, part of the project. So they were self-selecting, but, and then the, it was a snowball effect. They would refer their friends. And, uh, and of course it was also a little bit of one-stop shopping because there were also pageant people who were also in sororities. Um, and so it was very productive. I, I'm interested in the interview excerpts, um, the way in which, um, you, the girls are fairly reluctant to um, speak directly about race in the institutions they're participating in. Um, I think the their forthcoming conversations about the process and about the stages are um, illuminating, but the kind of direct grappling with um, the kind of racial contours of the whiteness of Southern beauty, right? Um, you have to tease out between the lines with them, right? Do you, um, do you have reflections on that process or um, why um, the kind of racial characteristics are hard to really tease out with the young women? Um, I'm trying to look back and think about that. There were not too many that were terribly forthcoming about that. I don't know if, of course, at that point, for most of them had the, there, there had been no attempts at desegregation of the sororities, although um, I, I addressed that um, through secondary sources, well, through some primary sources as well, but not through interviews, uh, when the University of Alabama um, desegregates. Um, so, so I don't know, you know, I am able to, to tease it out, but it's not all from directly from interview subjects. Do you have thoughts on what might be different if you were doing, if you were able to kind of go into sororities or beauty pageants now and have these conversations um, in, you know, the present? What do you think you would find? Would it be similar? I mean, I went online just out of curiosity to the University of Mississippi's website and scanned through the Tridelts, the Cayos, and the you know Katies, and there didn't seem to be remarkable change in the racial makeup of the houses. Some, but not a lot, right? Exactly. And I think you speak in the book to structurally why that cosmetic change doesn't change the structures, right? So what do you think you would find if you tried to have these conversations with, you know, 20 year old college students today? Well, some are more self-reflective than others. I mean, I certainly found that with my interview subjects. I did a lot of interviews where I learned, you know, nothing terribly new, it was sort of more of the same. And then I had a, a few, that were remarkably thoughtful and articulate about their observations. And, and so my book is fairly um, streamlined because I wanted it to have a certain pace and to not, it, it used to be much longer. <laughs> uh, and so of course I, I, I am very judicious about the quote, actual quoted material that I use because does it, does it really add something compelling and say it in a compelling way. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that I can venture about wh what I would find now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do know that, that as you say, there, you know, it, 
the desegregation of, of sororities at the of mainline white sororities at the University of Alabama only happened in 2013, I think. Uh, so we're not talking about a very long ago. <laughs> and it only happened uh, after essentially the, I believe she was the provost, was shamed by the students because it, uh, up to then, everything had been um, supported by the administration and by the structures of, of the clubs themselves, uh, very much hand in glove. And it would not have um, it would not have come to a head if if they were final were not finally shamed by some student journalists um, who sort of outed some of the racist practices of the voting process. Uh, where there were African American students going through recruitment, as they call it now, um, and the adults who assist adult members of the of these Greek letter organizations were removing uh, candidates from the bid lists so that they were not even voted on. And uh, in a couple of the houses, uh, students raised their hand and said aren't we even going to talk about the black girl? And that's how change finally came to the University of Alabama. But this is a very, and that's part of the story that my book tells is how resistant to change, you know, how uh, with all deliberate speed, and I do mean deliberate, uh, these changes took place. Yeah, it's in, I mean, I, I'm interested in that kind of difference we might find today also because I feel um, the moment you um, illuminate so well for us in the early 20th century across these three institutions was still very much a moment when a kind of decorum persisted around um, overt racist practice. So while the South, I think, you know, racism had definitely not disappeared in the second half of the 20th century. By 2000, certain things weren't said in certain spaces, right? And the kind of public veneer was a kind of um, um, repression of the overt racism, which we had seen so powerfully in the early 20th century. Right? Yeah, that's one, and that's one of the silences that I uh, explore in the book. There are so many silences and, and um, but in the, you know, during the massive resistance and during Jim Crow, it was just a heyday of, of racist uh, iconography and productions on campuses. There's lots of black face. There's all sorts of Confederate Dixie Weeks. And, and, and these, you know, there was, it was, you know, uh, part, and, part and parcel of campus culture. Um, and then after, of course, after the, uh, Voting Rights Act and, and uh, major changes of the civil rights movement, um, it, it gradually becomes verboten to be um, overtly racist and to speak, but but it, but the the productions continue, mm -hmm. and I, what I argue is that uh, this Southern beauty, the performative Southern beauty, um, you know, is persists in a way that. Um, you know, she's a symbol that persists actually now longer than the Confederate flag, <laughs> but does some of the same racial work because she is uh, silent, passive. I talk about her as uh, passive resistance to, uh, you know, the counterpart to the loud and violent massive resistance, but she was always the symbol, especially on camp college campuses. She was, uh, as I say in the book, motif of, of the white segregated South and its rationale, because she was the, um, you know, she justified everything from slavery to Jim Crow to lynching. And she was the emblem of the segregated South, our, our way of life. And so, um, but, you know, what I talk about is looking at that shift when we're ostensibly moving into a nascent multi multiculturalism um, and a more 
at least tolerance um, in the 70s and 80s and 90s. But there's always this undercurrent uh, that, you know, it's no longer to be, it's okay to be um, just outspokenly racist, but that there are still these productions. And of course there are uh, lots of the hidden, hidden uh, productions of, of racist fraternity parties and things like that, <clears throat> that still surface. Um, but she is still performing this um, regional symbol in all sorts of ways that continue. And I think that um, part of the reason that she's as successful as she is, as serving as a symbol, is because um, she's a woman. You know, how could she, how could a woman possibly be doing anything important? <laughs> so, you know, uh, but uh, I'm not sure that I'm saying that, that, uh, that people were unaware of the, of the racial cultural work that she did. Uh, and that's another silence that I talk about, that, that, that observers and audiences are complicit in this whole scene because they give her all sorts of social rewards for performing this version of womanhood in all these different venues. Um, and so it, the, the cycle continues. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that I think is um, terrifying about the last 10 years, but maybe 15, is I think we, that um, covert Southern racism has, I think, um, transformed yet again back to its more overt forms. So as you, you know, as I watched um, Charlottesville unfold, you know, on, on my TV screen and saw um, the neo-Confederates that had been um, seeming like they were losing steam in 2000, completely reanimated to, you know, um, lead a charge that, you know, resulted in someone dying in Charlottesville, right? It, it felt like um, the kind of um, reaction formation to President Obama and the kind of hatred unleashed by Donald Trump had really reactivated an overt Southern racism, the likes of which had been tamped down, right? I think it had never gone away, but it had been released again in a, in a racial formation that feels to me very different than 2005. Yes, and uh, Confederate Spring, Rolling Stone called it, um, with, with these, um, this, this re resurgence of, of this white supremacy, racist um, speech and actions. Um, and, and that's why it's, you know, it, it really, um, after uh, Emmanuel, the murders at Emmanuel Church, and there was, but before George Floyd's murder, um, there was this sort of outflowing of, 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 of uh, white people, especially Southerners, I think, um, you know, finally admitting to themselves what the real cause of the Civil War was. <laughs> and, you know, as historians, it's kind of hard to take. It's kind of baffling that, you know, but there was still so much resistance to understanding the Southern past for what it was. And, and the reasoning behind it, because there was, uh, and, and this is the other silence that I talk about in the book, which is this, this desire to, to not know because it, it protects your, your white privilege, you know, to not, to not have to think about it. It'd be better to, to dissemble or just sort of not have to deal with that. Um, and then these murders, um, you know, there was no long, for so long, in that in that late you know last quarter of the 20th century especially um there was this phrase heritage not hate it's our heritage you know about confederate symbols and, and all of that um and that no longer held any water after, after that point and people had to um so i think that so there was this outpouring at least initially um of recognition and 
and admitting that what they had always been told or what they had always believed, which you know had very little to do with historical fact, um, but the way that they had understood their white Southern identity was so based on, um, you know, family tales and <laughs> uh, myths that, but to have that shattered and have to truly look in the mirror, uh, historically speaking, was very difficult for a lot of people. Yeah, and and the polarization I think we see in the country we see reflected across the South as well, right? You know, both in um, the tensions between white Southerners who tried to uh, finally account for that history in some meaningful way and the entrenchment of white Southerners determined not to look at that history in some way. I'm writing now about um, neo-confederates and white supremacy on the internet, right? So it makes it harder to, to be kind of hopeful. But then um, looking at um, Georgia's role in the last couple of um, election cycles to, you know, really kind of illustrate a different South organized through the work of Black women. I wonder, Roche, if you would like to talk at all about that, given your book that so you know, powerfully traces um, a kind of figure of Black femininity in relation to these histories. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to talk about and think about. And I am really uh, inspired by Black women's insurgency in the U.S. public sphere, as well as in, in global contexts in, in varying manifestations. The, I mean, I, I um, there, there's just so much to consider. Um, one question that I have had relates to Black Greek practices, uh, debutante cotillions, pageants, and a range of other events that I think in some ways build upon and extend from traditions that have been established in the uh, history of the U.S. South spanning back to the uh, antebellum era, but are constituted and deployed for very different goals. Um, you know, community development, scholarship funds. And so that's one thing. I've also been thinking about the work of Lawrence Ross, his book, Black Bald, um, Black and White Politics on American Campuses. He's another person I think that you you definitely um, need to talk to at some point, Elizabeth, and maybe yes. have a conversation with because his work is, is um, you know, he looks at, universities across the country and also mentions the Oklahoma scene very early in his book. They're actually one of the first chapters is devoted to discussion of that context, but then also um, a range of other uh, places, notably the University of Alabama and the, the machine there, how it works. And he talks a bit about the, um, an illustration of a young black woman who was excluded um, within the Greek system in spite of her, um, when we say the Greek system in that context, mainly the white centered one, excluded in spite of her family roots. What's provocative about what he suggests and what your book raises, I think, for me is that one of his assertions is that even students, white students who are not from the South, internalize the ideologies, these race and gendered ideologies of Blackness and work in ways that ex systematically exclude Blacks from the Greek system on the premise of the argument that admitting them would compromise the respect of the organization. So in his estimation, even in, in so many cases, not even just Southerners who participate in and enforce these hierarchical systems, but also white students who come to the um, South to be educated. And the concern there is really that these Greek organizations in some cases are, um, or in a lot of cases, are microcosms of the real world institutions 
into which these students will go out and work and then continue these practices and politics of exclusion. And so that's one thing. And then the other question for me has to do with um, how, you know, if this functions as a kind of industry, you know, if, like, you know, so many um, items are being purchased, you know, whether we're talking about the gowns and all of that, like weddings could have easily been a part that's of it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who, who reaps the benefits? Is it women in some cases, or, you know, who has the, a stake in the system that perpetuates it? And then, you know, if there are any positives, like, you know, to what extent it is, is it serviceable? And how is it different from other um, practices and performances of femininity that we might see staged in Hollywood or, you know, social media, or even cross-culturally, you know, in contexts from say, um, Africa to India? Well, you know, Rache, uh, I, I kept tabs on Bama Rush this year. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll admit it, I got a TikTok account just so I could lurk. And um, the first of all, uh, the University of Alabama has been so aggressively offering out-of-state student uh, scholarships uh, because they can charge more uh, tuition, we all know this, to out-of-state students, and to where only about a third of students there are from Alabama now. And so most of the students are from out of state. And that includes these, um, these people uh, involved in Sorority Rush. In fact, this year's It Girl of the internet um, of, of, of Bama Rush was a pageant girl from Ohio, <laughs> Kylan Darnell. And, um, you know, the, the, um, Statistics alone tell me that uh, there's a lot of investment in these people coming from out of state and performing white southernness as they see it and understand it. So uh, it's for some, you know, they, it's a social system that they want to be a part of, um, and and um, who what who reaps the benefits? Well. Uh, there are certainly social benefits. I think that that's that's the goal, and that's why the it's, you know it's, I call it a feminine stratification ritual, um, <clears throat> where you know the the clubs with the, with the most um, respect, to use your word, or reputation. They're all about re reputation management, and they uh, don't want to um, become known as um, you know. They're, they're, Early on, they, they didn't want to have uh, African-American members because they were afraid certain fraternities wouldn't hold parties with them, right? Uh, if I may, may I read a little passage here about the desegregation of Alabama of this? Uh, yeah, let me do that. <clears throat> the comforting insularity of the mainline Southern sorority house was disrupted by the dark rush she on the doorstep. Even at the dawn of the 21st century, the African-American hopeful threatened the premise and the promise of sorority membership as white Southerners had long understood them. Anticipation of a golden time of race and class privilege received in exchange for performing revered renditions of womanhood were shattered by the worthy black candidate waiting just outside. With natural race difference exposed as false, the pact of securing social position through gendered rituals of exclusion was suddenly absurd. The black rushy at the door was literally, historically, and imaginatively upsetting, a living, breathing invalidation of certain understandings of Southerness. Sororities consequently reacted with defensive regret, falling back on age old platitudes about freedom of association. For many years, this approach had worked. <clears throat> White Southern sororities remained segregated decades after the desegregation of Southern universities and indeed Southern fraternities. Adamant that desegregation not be forced on them, sororities had maintained a passive approach 
to widening the pool of rush registrants, most never moving beyond the informational pamphlet that universities bulk mailed to all new female students. Everyone has been given the opportunity off officials side, echoing the same lame lament long offered to explain workplace hiring inequities of every sort. But where equal opportunity law spelled out the fact that it was not enough to crack open the gates of access, active recruitment and mentoring were required to address entrenched patterns of discrimination, sororities preserved the status quo and expressed few qualms about their racial makeup. Members were quick and vocal about espousing ideals of diversity, but slow and vague about their responsibility and action plans for realizing such goals. Compelled to complete, contemplate radical change, actives dissembled, their imaginations seemingly immobilized, as, as if they literally could not conceive of social equality in the place of the privilege they had all but convinced themselves was the product of healthy competition and personal choice. Deflecting their gaze from the structures of unearned favor that benefited them, sorority members engaged in not seeing and not knowing in the blissful ignorance that is the bargain of privilege. Where less is, is spoken, more is performed. Faced with the unthinkable, sororities fell back on manners. The same precise performance and exacting evaluation of etiquette that had produced these strongholds of advantage also protected them. African-American students rushing traditionally white Southern sororities experienced the same polished welcome and rapt attention as everyone else. And so were baffled as well as disappointed when they were abruptly cut from every house in the second or third round. When Melody Twillity was denied a bid at the University of Alabama in 2000 and again in 2001, she was initially flabbergasted. Bright, attractive, upper middle class and a native Alabamian, she was just like the other Rushies. Only her race set her apart. At Skit, I went to, only went to one house, Twilly told reporters, but I felt so at home at that house. This is elite social ritual, <clears throat> uh, elite ritual practice, ex explained anthropologist Susan Harding of Rush. It's tacky to be verbally racist, but perfectly acceptable to discriminate through your behavior, through your choices. Elite racism is implicit, acted out, behaved, not expressed in language. Thank you so much. That that's such a powerful passage. I want to just for a second acknowledge again our um, acquisitions editor at University of Georgia Press, Bethany Sneed, who's on. Um, I'm not sure if you're in a position to actually speak right now, Beth. But um, could you maybe say hello and um, mention the publication? Um, of this book and its impact if you are able to? Our other editor from University of Georgia is, um, as I mentioned, Maurice Hobson, who currently co-edits the New Southern Studies book series alongside me. Uh, Mo, are you there? I am here. I'm driving in the car, but I'm here. Okay, hopefully not too much Atlanta traffic today. Uh, no, I'm, I'm on the back road, so it's, it's all good. Okay, and welcome back. Actually, um, Maurice just took a wonderful uh, trip with his family to Thailand during his spring break. Um, could you say maybe a word to us? Well, listen, this has been extremely fascinating to listen to because I was a student, a graduate student at the University of Alabama, uh, where I witnessed all of the uh, the rushes, particularly in terms of fraternities and sororities, and as a member of a black uh, Greek letter organization whose initiation process is very different, it was always eye-opening. Uh, but I knew it was Twilly. I, I knew, you know, the whole thing, and I used to always wonder what that was about. And so this is, I, I find it to be fascinating because it does present, you know, different notions around, you know, notions of, 
um, femininity of feminism of womanism in black and white and how that kind of plays out. So I'm, 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 this is fascinating. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we definitely want to hear from our audience. So um, I, I, I see just um, so many um, really amazing uh, scholars, students, uh, including um, Katie Henninger, who I know works in photography. Um, and the book itself incorporates some and, and, and draws on some very rich photographic archives. And so there's a lot that I think can come up in this conversation. And so the floor is open for questions from our audience at this point. Yeah, UGA Press was very kind to me on my photo budget, <laughs> <clears throat> which was uh, still hard to choose. Uh, excellent, excellent. So well, we, um, wait for the audience. I have um, one slightly crazy question because I was just as I read the book, it made me think so much about our contemporary moment as well and what lessons we might draw from the past to understand the moment we're in today. And um, I recall years ago reading RuPaul's memoir and RuPaul claims that all um, RuPaul knew about performing femininity, he learned from Southern women, right? That the kind of um, drag scene in Atlanta in the 90s really um, had its root in understanding that Southern femininity was a performance. It was a stylized thing you could put on, right? And that, you know, you didn't necessarily have to be a biological woman to put that style on. And and, you know, in the years since we've seen, you know, something like RuPaul's Drag Race become a top television show going into tons of seasons. And we've also seen um, drag performance and trans identity weaponized across the South in the last, you know, um, two years with, you know, Tennessee recently just outlawing kind of drag performance, right? right? And I wonder like what we could take away from um, how white womanhood is always framed as a thing that has to be protected to help us understand how um, trans identity is now configured as the thing that threatens womanhood. Mm. And so many of the legislative bills figure um, kind of transness as a threat to women in bathrooms or, you know, in other places. It just seems an interesting um, tension point, you know, around um, different performances of femininity. Well, I don't have a particular response to that, but you're making me think of, of other things that are going on. Uh, you know, I... Uh, in terms of um, the backlash and, and um, the, the, the school, you know, books being banned and the school curricula debates um, that, you know, on the one hand, we're seeing, I've just been down in, in Natchez, Mississippi a month ago for their conference. And um, there was, I was on a panel talking about, um, uh, narrating a, a different story about your past um, with Jody Skipper, who works on, um, who's written a great book called Behind, uh, Behind the Big House and has a program for, for uh, helping communities um, interpret slave dwellings. And, and there's a lot of anxiety uh, within the local community about about this uh, changing this production, the the Confederate pageant that they've uh, called it something a little more innocuous now, the historical Natchez pageant, but it's still sort of similar. Um, but at the same time, so that so they, they can't figure out what what pat story they want to tell about the past. But at the same time. Um, Black tourists are demanding. They want real history. They want to go and see tourist sites. You know, they want to go to um, like the the uh, National Museum of Peace and Justice in Montgomery. And so, on the one hand, we have this 
uh, demand for actual real historical information from, from um, black tourists uh, as well as others. Um, at the same time that we have these political arguments going on about what we can teach about the past. And essentially um, there's this protection you know, that white people don't wanna feel bad about the past. <laughs> Essentially, you know, this, uh, what's the term that, that was uh, bandied around a few years ago, a white fragility, um, you know, and it's all based on that inability to look at the past and own it mm -hmm. and figure out where we're gonna go together from here. And I know, um, Tara, in your book, you spent, uh, you know, the, uh, you expressed a, a real concern about that that issue of uh, can we find a way of sharing southernness, of feeling southern, um, in a way that is cross racial alliance, you know, about finding a, a more progressive way to move forward. And, and I think that places like Natchez um, that are selling you know, old South tourist sites, <clears throat> they're sitting on a gold mine. If they would only change the frame of how they're uh, interpreting these tourist sites, they could really do something bold. And because they have an incredible, um, you know, these assets, tourist assets, all these homes. Um, and instead, I mean, I haven't, that's what I would love to see is, is to see that community really come together. We're talking about a black majority state. There's no shortage of people to, you know, to work on this. Uh, but they haven't to come to terms yet with how they want to see the past and what story do they want to tell. So I don't know if if the the um, I didn't really answer your question about um, transgender, you know, but but this sort of anxiety about that is part of the same project about. The curricula, <laughs> you know, we can't possibly. Uh, yeah, it's it's really holding on to to power and privilege. It's it's you know sharing those things doesn't come naturally, and when you're uh, the source of your power and your privilege has been bound up in not knowing and in reproducing uh, these through these uh, you know young women's rituals, in the case of what I'm looking at, um, suggesting that you give it all up and, and change is, uh, for some, a bridge too far. Yeah, I definitely sense a fatigue among white Southern friends who've stayed in the South. You know, I went to college in Mississippi, and though I haven't lived in Mississippi or Louisiana in decades, you know, I still have um, friends and family there and friends who have been engaged in different kinds of progressive work in Mississippi and really committed to being progressive Southerners. Um, yeah. Over the last five years, I, I could feel their fatigue and, and people, you know, have said to me, I'm done. I'm trying to find my way out. Right. And it's interesting how the retrenchment of a kind of um, far right has um, produced this friction among white Southerners that I think had, had laid low for a little while, right? You know, it was there in the 60s and 70s, and I think it's really back again as Southerners who understand the need to have different stories or to have cross-racial alliance are very frustrated at what they feel like a a sliding back to, to older models. Right. We, we have a question from Katie Henninger in the box. And wow. let's see. In the chat, let me yes. see. Uh, she says, Beth, okay. if I heard correctly, there was a generational element in the shaming of a UA administration by current sorority members versus the older members who were cutting the bid lists, um, culling the bid lists. Yes, as I haven't yet been able to read your book, did, did your ethnographic research show evidence of this generational change or did young women talk about this at all 
This is often the case in bathroom discussions. <laughs> uh, so, um, there was some frustration with with the young women, although the change came after I did my um, field research there. Um, they were somewhat circumspect to talk about that. But so I, I, my field research actually was before the, the sort of showdown with uh, Judy Bonner um, in 2013. Yeah. But, but you know, the generational change that has been, that has been the case uh, wherever there has been change. Um, and I talk about it in the book that there, uh, it, the first ones to change were because uh, at sororities where that had a simple majority, there was no blackballing. And so I think it was at FIMU at Ole Miss. Um, and, and so structurally that made it easier for that group to admit new members that they wanted. Whereas if you have alumni um, members basically calling the shots and, 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 and you know, the, the, the girls have to go against these older um, women members to, to make change. So that's tough. What is fascinating too, is that this is a very woman-centered um, phenomenon, even if it has been to a great extent serviceable to patriarchy. And so in a backdoor way, um, it affirms the ability of women to, as, as the book suggests, to be the arbiters and sustainers and bearers of cultural memory. And so the question becomes how to best redirect and redeploy what are, um, to a certain extent, very valuable uh, skill sets and assets, but for less ideological purposes. And, it, and it's in that case that um, African-American Southerners and the Black diaspora more generally, I think are interesting and, and useful models. You know, someone myself who's very much a, a byproduct of the um, debutante slash church, well, church even first, debutante slash um, wedding slash modeling culture in yeah. the South. Yeah. I mean, it, it does function, I think, as a kind of industry with so many um, stakeholders, you know, bridal shops are everywhere. Yeah. And even by the time that I graduated from high school, had literally needed for various formal events, uh, 15 different um, gowns, tried on 40 dresses to find the right debutante dress. And it was number 40 in the end. I think about what it meant to come of age, you know, learning strategies um, of feminine comportment, uh, initially as a, mem a, a member of poised charm classes based at Gaper's department store and becoming a junior Gaper girl. And so all of that has actually been very formative in the lives of so many girls, not just even white ones, but a, a cross-cultural range. Right. And so the question I think is just, you know, the assessing the cultural impact and the continuing significance as far as how a range of feminine formations are produced, but then um, what of it, you know, as we continue forward. And every, you know, more questions are welcome from the audience as well. One book, another book that I read this year that I think pairs really nicely with Southern Beauty is Jesse Daniels' Nice White Ladies. And it's a book that's really um, also like Southern Beauty interrogating how etiquette and a performance of niceness um, could really be a kind of lethal weapon and how in a lot of ways that use of etiquette has under um, uh, has scaffolded white supremacy in a lot of instances. So right. while, you know, as someone who was raised as a Southerner, um, I don't want us all just to be rude, right? I do think it's really helpful for white women to stop and think about 
what niceness covers for us and how performing niceness in particular ways also supports systems that we claim we are trying to undo, right? And so I, I think the two books would teach together really nicely as well. I read her book, right. And, and of course, etiquette, I can't remember who said this, but but that etiquette is, is what allows uh, people, uh, you know, groups of people who are, uh, can be quite at odds with one another to, to live in close proximity without killing each other. And, <laughs> you know, um, etiquette uh, is a way of, it ultimately controls us, which is what you're talking about, uh, but it also controls other people, uh, racial etiquette, social etiquette, um, and becomes this yardstick in the case of these um, feminine rituals by which the, the young women are policing each other uh, and ultimately really in service of uh, heterosexual you know, patriarchy. Um, because if it, you know, why do they stay in the system? It's like, what are they really getting out of it? There's, there's such a cost. Um, so, but, but, but that's you know, asking, um, and it's part of what I'm asking, I'm, I'm hoping through the book is to uh, get young white Southern women to see the goldfish bowl right? To see this water in which they swim is, is uh, carefully constructed. And, and uh, you know, it's, it bears mentioning that, that the three rituals that I look at are all coming of age rituals in a way. Um, the, the t they all happen within a certain time frame of young women's lives. And the fact that there's so much social status that uh, adheres to these rituals, uh, there's so much at stake. Um, but the fact that it's a coming of age ritual means that it's naturally cyclical. You know, it keeps reproducing itself. Uh, and to, to step out of that and, and say, this is bunk, I'm not gonna do this. You know, there's a lot of familial pressure and there's a lot of peer pressure. But uh, as you uh, may have seen in the, the epilogue of my book, um, I show some young women that offer us some hope. We have um, a comment from <coughs> Professor Nicole Morris Johnson, who's at uh, University of Buffalo. Um, did you, and who, who works on actually Southern femininity? Oh, nice. Uh, and so the, the, the comment um, just shows appreciation for, for this uh, panel. Um, and then um, Dana Franklin, who is um, based in in Berkeley, and um, is 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 joining the uh, community at Cornell in the PhD program in literatures in English. Uh, Dana, would you um, ask your question, please? Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Professor Boyd. Thank you, Professor McPherson. And thank you, Professor Richardson for inviting me. So what came to mind is, so my research that I'm working on right now is the, is the US feminine aesthetics and how they impact Afro-diasporic women and girls. And so what, so the ideas were that were talked about today were heritage, not hate, blissful, not the blissful ignorance and finally performance. And what that brought to mind to me was who ends up being more harmed by white Southern femininity? Would it be white women? Would it be, you know, the so-called other, you know, women of color, men, or, or even, you know, I think it was a Professor McPherson brought up transgender individuals, would it be them or global culture as a whole. I would, would answer it would be global culture as a whole, but I'd like to hear what, what your thoughts on who is harmed by this idea of white Southern femininity and also by the, the nice white lady. I will look into that book as well, but that idea as well. Thank you. Um, well, it's definitely not white men. <laughs> Because they, you know, uh, so much of what goes on in in these rituals, um, I'm I'm especially thinking about campus culture, but also beauty pageants. Um, 
benefits a, a really patriarchal gaze and and um, yeah um, and and in on campuses the, the there's a direct you know the the sororities give way too much of power away to fraternities to determine who they're gonna who they will um, swap with and party with and this that and the other um, and I'm not quite sure why they do that when it would seem that young women could turn that around if they wanted to, but I'm, I'm not sure that's, it's uh, pretty in, ensconced. Yeah, well, what, I'd like to hear others thoughts on, on the, that question. I mean, I feel the kind of dominance of certain modes of white femininity across um, representation that's exported globally hurts um, everybody, but it particularly hurts folks who don't fit the idea that's sold as what femininity should be. I mean, I think there's been some fracturing of that monolithic standard of beauty by, um, you know, fabulous performers like Beyonce, right, who've opened up other modes of thinking about what femininity could be, but who still, you know, are um, responding to those kind of traditions of white femininity in very powerful ways, right? So, um, I think the cost in terms of psychic and physical violence is greatest to people who are not white. But I think um, there's a diminishing of possibility for what men or women could be when you participate in that white supremacist culture, right? And one of like it confounds me that Greek organizations persist um, when we have rampant evidence that young women on college campuses, white young women, are more likely to be raped if they participate in Greek culture, right? It's right. a, um, it's well known, right? But the force of alumni organizations and of nostalgia completely prevent um, getting rid of organizations that, you know, for, in their white form, um, do not serve people well, right? Even if people feel like, you know, they have access to social networks because of it. The reality of sexual assault in those spaces is deeply, deeply documented, right? So- As well as eating disorders. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, uh, even in beauty pageants, uh, you know, beauty pageants um, try to make out like, that you know they're they're post racial and that's always like a red flag to me, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and that and that they are diverse. And, but I have to say they haven't changed the the sort of the the target performance really. It's it really doesn't matter what hue your skin is if you're in these pageants. You're still trying to perform this sort of very similar. Uh, rendition of Southern femininity. I, I had, I went to a luncheon while I was down in Natchez with four um, former and I think one current Miss Mississippi, two of whom were, had been Miss America, including um, Linda Lee Mead Shea, who's in my book. <laughs> She's like 83. She looks incredible. Um, but the, but the, what was funny was uh, one of the young women was African American. I think she was the the current Miss USA Mississippi, so a different system, but but very similar. And she, I mean, she fit the cultural logic of the standard pageant perfectly. There was nothing radically different. I mean, what what I see is that, for instance, um, I don't think you're ever going to have within that system. It, it's so deferential. Uh, to community mores and to sort of this heterosexuality. And um, I don't think you're ever going to have African American contestants whose platform is, say, Black Lives Matter. Because <laughs> they're not going to have, it's just never going to be that um, anything radical or, or embracing Blackness is it really sort of doesn't fly within that within that system. Um, so it's it's a little bit 
uh, I don't know the word for it, but but it's they uh, like to present pageants as being sort of transformed and diverse, but I don't really see them that way. I think it's going to be important for more and more, including administrators, faculty, and staff members on campuses to um, become just more aware of all of the ways in which um, these kinds of um, contexts can, in some cases, sustain politics of othering. You know, I, I've heard from students in some cases about the phenomenon of, for instance, um, being pressured to wear these coats that cost a thousand dollars. Even as a full professor in the Ivy League, I there's no day that's going to come that I'm going to pay a thousand dollars for any coat. You know, I have a basic coat, so Your Canada down jacket. Will definitely be wearing better coats than I wear for for the foreseeable future, if not for the rest of my life. Um, but you know that there's a lot of um, I don't want to say shaming, but even like going into certain homes, they they like how houses they can check the labels of you know what is being hung up to get a sense of you know where people fall within the pecking order. I've seen in some cases students, um, you know, in very cold winter weather, barely like covered. You know, because obviously there's some kind of conformity to, you know, organizational standards. I think choice is always going to be important to protect, but um, to maybe even think more outside the box about how organizations can um, best carry out their missions um, in a way that's more inclusive, more considerate of, you know, a broader range of people, I think will be important to the extent that they um, are conserved. My introduction to these issues too happened, like I would say in 1981, um, when a friend of my aunt's was about to get married and the question be, you know, it re, uh, came up about wearing a, cause she was gonna have a quote unquote antebellum wedding, even though um, she's an African-American. And then this whole question came up about wearing a hoop. And my grandparents, like for days on end, were just very, concerned and adamant that my aunt um, Pam would not be wearing, a, who was 21 at the time, would not be wearing a hoop in any wedding ceremony like as, as a bridesmaid. And so I thought about that iconography and symbolism and what it means very carefully as I saw, you know, how seriously concerned my, my grandparents were about the, the question. And ultimately, Thank goodness, you know, there were no hoops worn under the dresses and they were gorgeous. Actually, some of the most gorgeous bridal gowns I've ever seen in my life. But that was the introduction. We're short on our time at this point. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, both you, Elizabeth, and you, Tara, to maybe make a concluding uh, statement. And then it's back to Professor Tao to close us off and to maybe um, give us a heads up about some of the upcoming programming. Right. Um, I just want to briefly thank you, Roche, and your department, and um, Elizabeth, for the opportunity to um, have the conversation and think through um, the weirdly enduring legacy of this figure of Southern beauty that centers whiteness over and over again, and to have a, a chance to begin to think about ways we might imagine um, operating otherwise, like when will um, other figures who don't adhere to these traditions of white Southern beauty become what we think of when we think of femininity in the South? You know, how can we um, encourage um, different kinds of cross racial alliance and political practice and um, tap into those um, less known traditions of progressivism in the South? in both white, black, and other immigrant communities and you know, move those um, forward as a vision of what the South can be. Thank you. Yes, thank you to all for your being with us this afternoon and giving me the chance to talk with all of you about this topic. Um, I, I think I want to end by just saying that it's my hope that um, that readers will um, come to understand how this symbol has been 
ubiquitous and powerful while still being uh, unrecognized and ignored. Um, I am interested in what will happen with this symbol. I'm thinking about the hoop skirts. Um, the, the tourist official, officials in, in Natchez raised the, raised the question, how would we sell Southern tourist sites without these symbols? And I think they've become so accustomed, you know, what they're really selling, they want people to buy tickets to tour these homes, but you don't have to have everybody in a hoop skirt, <laughs> which can be, a, you know, offensive to a whole lot of potential tourists. And I think that, that that's part of uh, what I want to end with is this, is to problematize why has this become, why has this become so, um, why have we normalized this? You know, every spring, the Southern landscape is full of all these young women in hoop skirts from these various pilgrimages and, and campus productions. And we've normalized it so much that uh, no one sees the issue. And I guess I hope to problematize that, yeah. Thank you both. Thank you both so much for this just deeply engaging, revealing, and thought-provoking conversation. I'm so thankful and inspired that we've actually done it as we've been planning it for a long time. And I'm just so thankful that it has come together so beautifully. Uh, Professor Taiwo. Uh, well, you know, let me first say that when I thank you both now, uh, I'm not just thanking you for the work you've just done, but I'm actually thanking you from a very deep place in my heart for teaching me today. And make no mistake about it, this education is an addition to what I've always learned about this topic from my dear colleague and teacher, uh, and you are now joining her and others in that. And I'm definitely going to read both books. Um, I hadn't read them before today. Um, so that's what I mean by really opening me up uh, to a whole lot of these uh, elements that you have talked about. <clears throat> and uh, so it gives me additional pleasure to thank you for saying yes to us, for doing all this work uh, for us and for the audience. And uh, I look forward to future conversations. Uh, to the audience out there, thank you again for sharing some of your time with us. We hope you have been rewarded, uh, even if only in part. Uh, thanks again, Shelby, for uh, your work and for sending me a very quick reminder. These are the events that are coming up. You know, <clears throat> On Monday, the 27th, we have a virtual lecture on Harriet Tubman by Professor Janet Hobson. On Wednesday, the 12th of April, our colleague, Professor Tamika Nonley, will be talking about her new book, you know. Um, and on Monday, the 17th of April, we have our annual endowed lecture, uh, the Monday Distinguished Lecture, and to be given by Professor Vincent Brown uh, from Harvard University. Uh, his theme is called Black History's Warning to the World. Um, He's a very optimistic person. Um, we hope the world listens uh, to the warning. <laughs> That's what I would just say. So again, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Rishi, for really uh, putting this together and uh, anchoring it. I appreciate that deeply on behalf of the department. Thank you.